1914 was the beginning of the end of innocence for Australia. There were rumblings of war from the other side of the world. The German Empire's aggressive expansionism was directly threatening the interests and the security of Great Britain. And when Mum was under threat, her young child, Australia, was ready to run to her side. Australia had already offered up its youth for wars in the Sudan, South Africa, even the Boxer Rebellion in China. But this was the big one. Being a valued part of the Commonwealth gave the new nation security and a sense of place in the world. When war was declared on August the 4th, 1914, even while Britain's forces were starting to mobilise, Australia was battle ready. In fact, the first battleground of World War I wasn't mainland Europe, but thousands of miles away here at Point Nepean in Victoria. And Major Bernie Gaynor is going to show me what happened. So who was the first shot fired at? The first shot was fired at a German freighter, the SS Fells. Where was it? The Fells was docked in Melbourne, about 80 kilometres over there. It had departed at dawn. It was coming up the South Channel. Had war been declared? War had been declared, but, but news that war had been declared had not reached here. War had been declared about two hours previously. Just as it was coming past here, the word came from the headquarters over at Queenscliff that war had been declared. A young officer, whose name was Veal, directed the guns to fire a warning shot across the bowels of the fells. That's what happened. And the guns are up here? This gun fired at around about two and a half hours after war was declared in London. And that is why this gun was the first gun among any of the Allied nations to fire a shot in World War I. So did the ship stop when the gun was fired? Well, not immediately, because the Australian pilot on the bridge, Captain Robinson... Yes! ...immediately telegraphed to the engine, full of stern. Yeah. The German, realising with horror what was happening, immediately countermarted and te telegraphed full ahead. And so for a brief, for a brief period, there was a, a, a physical tussle... They're wrestling on the bridge. On the bridge. Wrestling on the bridge. <laughs> Robinson and the German. <laughs> Robinson and the German. They were physically fighting. <laughs> go forward, go back, yeah. stop, surrender. No, I'm not. Until finally, Captain Robinson said, if you don't stop, the next shot will be into the ship. No, that's me. If you don't <laughs> stop, the next shot will be into the ship. Yeah, while well, mine here. Yeah. And that's what happened. At that point, the German realised that uh, he could do nothing. He stopped and he surrendered. Sometimes, just sometimes, I can wear my name with pride. The firing of the Point Nepean gun would mark the start of a worldwide conflict that would spill blood like no other. Between 1914 and 1918, 10 million soldiers would lose their lives, including 60,000 Australians. But sadly, despite all the carnage, the world superpowers weren't finished with war yet. Two decades later, they were at it again, with the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939. And so too was the gun emplacement at Point Nepean. I've got an eerie sense of deja vu. Not only was the first shot of World War I fired from here, but the first Australian shot of World War II was fired from where? The same gun, the same position. How come? That is so eerie. Indeed it was. Uh, a very strange turn of events. What happened in World War II was that war had been declared. A whole new series of regulations required of merchant vessels entering Port Phillip, and an Australian coastal vessel was trying to pass through the heads to enter into Port Phillip Bay. Signals were made, it didn't answer them. Boom, a shot was fired. Who by? By, by this gun, under the direction of Commander Veal. Commander Veal, the same bloke who'd given the order all those years previously when the shot was fired in the First World War? Indeed. The vessel didn't answer signals. 
that were made to it. So he was just having a pop at some lazy Australian sailors, basically? He was very, very uh, cheesed off with the way the maritime fellows were not adhering to the new requirements of signalling and, and answering because of the declaration of war. And he said they need to learn a lesson. And for the next two and a half years, it was the only shot fired in anger on Australian soil. City Hall, but what I wanted to show you was this. You always want to keep an eye out for one of these when you're on a walk. And down here is the basement of the City Hall. And the whole thing is undergoing a mammoth refurb at the moment. So these guys in the red day glow jackets are engineers, architects, that sort of thing. Sorry to burst in on you unannounced, by the way. Thanks. What intrigues me about this place is that it used to be, in the Second World War, the Red Cross Tea Room, where young soldiers from out of town used to come for a bit of cheer and a cup of tea. In the early 1940s, Brisbane, on Queensland's east coast, was just a big country town but it exploded into life as thousands of Australian and American servicemen suddenly poured into the area. The troops needed rest and relaxation, and that was where the Red Cross stepped in. Enlisted men at the City Hall tea rooms would be given a welcome pack. And among all the other goodies, there would be a pencil. And I'm going to show you what they used to do with that pencil. Lyris, would you come with me to the gentleman's toilet? Certainly. Thank you very much. Well, I haven't asked a young lady to do that ever. Well, certainly not since the, uh, the 1960s, anyway. Um, during the refurb, one of the first things that they had to do was hack all the plaster off the walls. And in this corridor, they were doing just that. And this was revealed. A whole wall full of Second World War soldiers' autographs. So, the urinal, all the stalls, were actually here, weren't they? That's right. After the men did what they had to do, they then took out their pencils and signed their names, as young men do all around the world. It must have been the done thing to add your name to the loo wall, but was it just an act of bravado? Or did leaving something as personal and tangible as a signature actually help the boys face an uncertain future? Something really rather sweet and tragic about that, isn't there? Oh, there's a lieutenant there. Lieutenant, I can't read his name. We think it's Gallon. Yeah. We've never been able to identify him, which means the highest ranking person on the wall that we have been able to identify is here, and it's Warrant Officer First Class Cross. Uh, what's your favourite? Uh, it has to be Mr Scott. Mr Scott is an original rat of Tobruk. Oh, like the desert rats, the guys yes. who fought in the North African yes. desert. In 1941, Australian troops held the strategic port of Tobruk against a combined German-Italian onslaught that lasted for eight months. The Nazis nicknamed the tenacious defenders as rats, an insult the Aussies ironically embraced. Of the 14,000 Australians who served there, 800 lost their lives for the cause. A lot of these guys must have died during the war, mustn't they? No, they all came back alive. How do you do that? 153 have been identified so far, and every single one of them has come back alive. That's really mystic, isn't it? It's wonderful, yeah. This is a great piece of history, just a, a snapshot in time, all these guys going off to war. I really like that. Well, thank you very much for showing You're me. Welcome. And also thank you for coming to the lab with me. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. It's a beautiful twist of fate that those soldiers' fragile scribblings on the wall list those who returned from war rather than commemorating the fallen. But then war is full of strange twists and turns. 